Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK today. I'm delighted to be joined by Sam Keyes. Sam is the Deputy Head Teacher and Senka Lead at St Bede's Catholic Primary School in the North East of England. And it's a Friday evening, so we're going to be very concise here. Sam, how are you and thank you for joining me. Yeah, I'm feeling good. Uh, just recovered from COVID and just uh, yeah bouncing back and back to work for a couple of days. So yeah, feeling okay. Yeah, me too. I mean, we we um we connected a couple of months ago through an LBQ um, a Learning by Questions webinar, and uh, we've tried to arrange this a few times. And um, we've both suffered from COVID lately. Um, how's the um how's the COVID challenge in schools? Still still pretty much the same same picture. Um, we're we're definitely hitting more staff at the minute than than kids. So it doesn't seem to be rippling through kids as much, but we are suffering from a bit more staff absence than, than last time. So I would say that's the same, if not worse, maybe. Yeah. And um, t tell us a little bit more about the context of, of your school, just for people uh, listening, because, you know, I've got a, a general understanding so far. But what about um, for new people? How would you describe the school? Yeah, so we're a Catholic primary school um, reception through to six in um, a council estate in... Newcastle, or just at the west end of Newcastle. It's a real mix, um, real melting pot of a school with kids from all sorts of backgrounds. We've got a higher than average uh, proportion of English additional language, same for Pupil Premium, same for SEN. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice community school, slap bang, no grass or anything like that, right, you know, just a yard in the middle of a, um, an estate, but it's, it's a real great place. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of my uh, experiences of London, you know, a lot of secondary schools and you'd struggle to see a patch of grass. So it, you have to, you know, your sports hall's a real commodity, I suppose, and having, you know, kids keeping active, etc. So, it's, you know, it sounds a very challenging school. How many kids in the school? We've got 212. 212, it sounds, yeah. so, sounds like quite an, an interesting place. And how long have you been there, Sam? I've been there for, this is coming up to four years next month, so yeah. Okay, great. Well, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, a question I always ask all my listeners is, um, describe your 16-year-old self. Oh. What are you like at school? 16-year-old self. I was going through a real phase where I was anti-education, um, tricky things going on at home, and that yes. really, really showed. I was that kid in the class that needed extra love and attention but after it in the most bizarre of ways right okay that's interesting and 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 so what happened after school you know how did how, can i just unpick how we got to the kind of teacher conversation what yeah, what happened exactly. after school well actually that kind of links to that 16 year old self so there was a teacher in that that time it was when i was um doing a levels at sixth form and it was mr clifford and he sort of he was the guy who asked the questions and took me under his wing type thing and made me feel like I needed to be there. Right. Um, so, so I went on, he taught me psychology. So I went on and did a degree in psychology um, at university. And then it was sort of third year at university. We did a module about um, education and childhood studies. And I thought, you know what? I fancy a piece of that. Um, got in touch with my old primary school, did a couple of weeks yeah. of experience, started my training, and then that was right, it. Right, you're hooked. Wow. Class. So at uh, uh, university in Newcastle as well? Or? No, I went, to, um, I went to Preston. I was at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, okay, great. That was great. And then I did um, a skit in, in Newcastle after that, yeah. And then, then teaching back in Newcastle? Yeah, yeah. Got a job great. in the school, school that I trained in and stayed there for about seven years. Right, well, what a great story. And so um, there for seven years... Um, you know, a particular key stage or a year group? Yeah, so that was a bigger school. That was um, a one and a half form entry, so there was mixed classes. So I taught, the first class I taught was a year four, five class, and then did a couple of year two, three classes, which were interesting, being key stage one and key stage two. Uh -huh. um, and then I sort of, I got a little bit of an interest in the SEN side of things. Right. Um, and then the St. Good Off School left, and the job came up. And as you probably know, not many people put their hats in the ring for a Senko job. It's um, a tough I, job, yeah. I, I kind of wanted to see what it was like. So I took on that role as sort of an aspiring Senko, did the um, national award, uh, and then got that got that job permanently as well. So And I haven't, you know, that's I've been hooked on Sen too, really, since right. then. 
Fantastic. And, and um, I, I found in my experience, once people get into SEN, SEN, SEN that's it. it. It becomes quite a, uh, you know, if, uh, teachings of vacation, as you'll know. But uh, the SEN part becomes, um, it is something you live and breathe 24-7, isn't it? D- did you then come to St. Bede's after that, that particular job? Yeah, so I was sent on class teacher and um, somebody sort of suggested that I went on... Uh, some aspiring leadership courses and I thought about it and then one of the bits of feedback I got in my first session was that um, they said I'd pigeonholed myself I was too SEN focused so I, I couldn't be a deputy <laughs> nice <head>. feedback <laughs> and I was I was a bit worried I was like well I, I do want to go into school leadership and I do want to maintain this sort of passion for SEN and so then I thought about whether I moved to specialist provision and then I was flicking through the advert and I saw um, Deputy head teacher, class teacher, and Senko, and I thought that's a bit of me, and here I am. Um, and for for someone um, you know maybe listening who's interested in teaching or from outside of education, particularly a parent, um, I know this is a, a big question, but c- what what is the role of a Senko? What kind of things are you doing strategically on a termly basis? And then how does it look on a daily basis? So there's lots of questions there. So what's Senko? What's it look like strategically and and day to day? Yeah, so Senko is, that is a big question. Senko is a special (laughs) educational needs um, and disabilities coordinator. Um, I always think it's a ridiculous role. I like to say that I am a champion for the kids who need that extra bit, um, Mm -hmm. specifically regarded to those additional needs and disabilities so day to day my role is the oversight i'm making sure mm-hmm. that the kids that need stuff have got stuff the teachers are teaching them to how you know to in the best possible way for those children to, ex- to excel and achieve their potential i'm a barrier remover you know if there's mm-hmm. something in the way i need to be there supporting teachers getting that that barrier out of the way i'm looking at interventions what extra things we can do outside the classroom and in the classroom i'm monitoring their progress I'm working with parents to try and find out those little nuggets of information that are going to completely change the day for that child. And maybe, you know, from the tiniest thing like how their morning routine was through to, um, you know, whether they've lost their spelling book, you know, whatever else, through Mm -hmm. to um, the really struggle in a noisy environment. I'm I'm there to try and make it as easy as possible. And and give us a a kind of picture of the kind of strategic things that you're doing termly, annually, as paperwork, funding, that type of stuff? Yeah, so typically the majority of kids fall under what we call SEN support, and that means it's school just picks that up within their own um, budget. Some children qualify for extra funding, but that requires quite a bit of paperwork. Um, we have termly targets set. That's another sort of round of paperwork. There's lots of uh, meetings with other professionals, reports, referrals. It's it's quite paperwork heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, what without putting people off, um, uh, you, what's the best part of the job? Uh, you know, you said you, you, it's that need stuff, and you, you kind of give the stuff that, that the kids need, and uh, you kind of unlocking those barriers and. That, uh, well, I, I guess we can't go into specific case studies, but um, I'm sure you have lots of great moments in, in your role. Could you give us a little insight for people listening, uh, what, kind of what you do? Yeah, yeah. So I guess the the best thing for me is, you know, when you've got a child in your class or you, you, you work with a child and you've made a difference to them in the air and you celebrate the progress they've made in the air, I get mm-hmm. to do that throughout their whole school journey. I get to see them when, from from a parent concern or a teacher concern where they're like, oh, I think something, you know, needs to be done to support that child, through to that child going on to high school and doing well. And recently, obviously, without going into details, I received feedback from a high school about a child who's really, really thriving. He's not just doing well, he's thriving. And I think without our support at primary and without that strong transition, that might not have even been the case. That could have been a school exclusion. It could have been something else. Um, So I get that, that... progress journey but i get it times by six or seven sometimes yeah and i think uh, you know I'm, I'm speaking very loosely here you know i don't have any hard evidence but i i, I kind of stick my neck out and think we should do more at secondary level to l- let primary schools know how certain kids are doing and i know you know i've never been a senko and i've never worked 
very closely with Senkos, but I know that they probably do that, and much of that information at a whole school leadership team is probably lost. Any tips for secondary schools to do that better? Yeah, what I make a point of is I make a point of uh, letting the secondary schools know that I want to be at the first review in September or October, the autumn term, and I really insist on it, and I'm like a dog with a bone. I, I have to be there. And when you've got your face in there, and when they, mm -hmm. let, when, you, when they can see that you've got that knowledge of that child, they'll keep inviting you back. So if I'm speaking to secondary schools, just let us in. I know mm -hmm. you do it differently. I know secondary schools work in a completely different way. Our local secondary schools are so different to, to our setup. But let us, let us have a go at telling you what's worked because it might you know, mm -hmm. answer a few questions for you and solve a few problems. And in, in terms of your role, just uh, I guess the last question on it, I suppose. Um, what what's the kind of career trajectory for someone like you that could either go you know obviously headship next or is there a more specialized field you can get into down the SEN road it's something that i guess i'm at that crossroads myself thinking about what is next i think ultimately for me i'd love to be a head teacher i'd love that that whole school complete oversight however mm -hmm. there's been roles that i've seen advertised where it's special specialist or whether it's um consultancy work with regards to SEN. I've looked at those two. I don't know. At the minute, I don't want to leave, leave a classroom, and that's where I'm at. So I'm quite happy well, that, with that, that. that. There's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, you know, if I just change the conversation slightly, we know uh, workload's a particular focus of mine, and I, I know COVID has got in the way, but uh, is it possible to kind of think before COVID, what would be the workload pressures for teachers in general from your perspective in the Northeast and perhaps as a Senko, what, 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 are the, what are the kind of general pressures that you face? General pressures obviously vary from SLT to SLT in school to school, don't they? And the demands mm. that are placed upon different teachers through policies and practices and things like that. Generally, the bugbears are obviously, you know, your, your mark, and that's something that some schools are still quite archaic with in their terms mm. of their marketing and feedback policies. And our school is fortunate enough to have moved you know, we're not fully away from that, but we're moving away from the, you know, mark and 32 books per less. Um, scrutinies, book scrutinies and things like that, and le lesson observations that are landing on your door at the moment's notice and feeling like you need to teach a whiz-bang lesson every lesson. I was talking on a Primary Education Voices podcast the other week, and I mm -hmm. said, I'm not the best teacher, so I sh wh why should I try and do these lessons that are not me? If I, what I do, my bread and butter is good, and that's good enough. That's mm. good enough. If I'm consistently good, I'm a happy teacher. And, and how do you, uh, as a school leader, you know, I uh, throw in that word standards, how do you share that ethos with the rest of your teaching staff, knowing that, you know, what you do day in, day out when no one's watching is good teaching without this kind of show and tell performance or that burden of you're a great teacher if you mark all your books? I really try and lead by example, I guess. So when, you know, I'm I'm more than happy, I know COVID's put a blocker on that recently, but I'm more than happy to let teachers into my classroom and I'll just mm -hmm. teach. I'll just teach normally and I'll comment to them about how I'm not doing anything different. This is just a getting every single resource there is available in there to make it look 10 times better. I just teach. And when I'm doing a book scrutiny or whether we're doing a moderation session together, my books are my books. I haven't, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't cherry picked them. I haven't, you know, made them shiny and polished them up. My books are my books, and I'm really vocal about that. So I guess I'm authentic about it, in, that, in the hope that they'll see that. Well, if he's doing it, then we can do it too. I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if we go back to that marking policy, which we know is a headache for a lot of people, what what kind of things do you still need to tackle? Um, you know, you mentioned the, moving away from the notion of having to mark everything. Yeah. Where is your feedback policy at the moment? So we're in the in the sort of the limbo of we are where we are obviously looking at the book still. There's some sort of light touch marking, and then in some cases we we'll, we we'll call it feed forward, so next step stuff. But not mm -hmm. in the majority of cases, it's the few pupils that need that next step. Um, mm -hmm. It's the idea of who who are you marking for? 
Are you marking mm. for somebody else to look at the books? Are you marking for that child to learn and to progress? And if you're not doing it for the learn and to progress, you shouldn't do it anyway, I guess. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, you'll know my thoughts. That feedback, feed up, yeah. feed forward, the verbal, written, non-verbal, there's lots. Um, I, part of my role for people listening is getting to see all these fantastic school policies and trying to make them a little bit more refined to help everybody. Um, what are two ideas, Sam, on, on what wellbeing initiatives are you doing with your staff to promote teacher mental health and wellbeing? Um, is there anything that you're really proud of that you do that staff say this is what makes working at St. Bede's a great thing? We had a session actually a few weeks ago. It was we were a Catholic school. It was a, a prayer session, actually. And the person leading it asked us to sort of think about the atmosphere of school. And they imagined us to walk around the school and say what they thought. And the head and I were sat there obviously knowing what we wanted to say and what we hoped people would say. But in those moments, it's really good to listen. Mm. And they all talked about the atmosphere, how they feel they can go to each other with anything, school-related or otherwise. They all talked about how they felt we were a team. Nothing was too much. You know, if, if somebody was struggling, they would, it was mm -hmm. that wrap-aroundness. Um, and I guess that's, that's complete culture. That's not just a gimmick thing. We do do the gimmicky things as well. We'll give an early finish on a Friday, hence why I'm sat in that. Yeah, yeah, but those, right those, things, those things are important. Um, but that, that's good feedback from your staff. Oh, yeah, totally. And that's the sort of stuff you want to hear because you're not doing that for a tick in a box. You're doing that because, we, well, you know yourself, if you've got happy staff who feel safe and confident, you're going to get better teaching, aren't you? You're going to get better outcomes. Exactly. So uh, let me put you in a corner then. Give me, uh, in 30 seconds, why, why I should work at St. Bede's. In 30 seconds. Okay, so you should work at St. <laughs> Bede's because we've got a forward-thinking leadership team that are really looking at what can be changed to benefit staff and pupils. We've got a really healthy budget at the moment. So, you know, you could be an uppercase There you go. Well, that, there's a positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got early finish on a Friday and we've got staff who genuinely care about you and the kids are the best. Great. And uh, one more. Uh, what's, what's professional development like for your staff? It's not one size fits all and, you know, bog standard dry stuff, is it? And no sign of a, a lunch. Do you get tea and coffee on inset day? Oh, yes. And lunch, yeah. <laughs> um, we're... We'll, we'll let staff come to us with their needs. We're, we're constantly talking about where they want to go next. Performance management is a, it's a conversation. It's, a, you know, it's two people are in that situation and they're talking about what they want to do next and what could be best for school, but what's going to be best for them. We're really about growing our leaders as well, you know, mm -hmm. with the hope that one day that they'll either take over from us or they'll, you know, they'll fly off elsewhere and do great things. Fantastic. And um, I, I, one, I'm trying to keep things punchy for the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I've got one more question because it's just interesting. You know, I, I suffered from the London bubble as a teacher for 30 years. I've lived in Newcastle for a year of my life. And as you'll know, I travel to schools all across the country, but I don't get to the northeast as much as I'd like to. But what's it like to teach in the northeast? Give give listeners a flavour. Um, the, ki the kids are, are funny. They, they, they will tell you it how it is. They won't, you know, yeah. If, if there's something on their mind, they'll tell you. Um, brutally honest at times. Yeah. You know, to, today they told me that um, they thought I'd maybe had a little bit too much chocolate while I was off with, with COVID. <laughs> um, they're, they're really keen to learn. They want to be there. Um, they're mad on... Uh, the extracurricular stuff, our uptake for after school club is, is yeah. crazy. I mean, really also, important. you know, demographically, you know, Newcastle's a great city, but you're close to the sea, you're close to the border, uh, the countryside, you know, what, what else is there to offer? We've got everything. The city is amazing, but 10 minutes from the city, 50 minutes from our school, you've got the beach. If you drive 20 minutes the other way, you're in complete rural Northumberland. You, mm. you could literally go from farm to city to beach in the space of an hour. It's, it's great. Incredible. I was lucky enough to be in, is it concert not so long ago, uh, up there working in a Peru. So, yeah, fabulous countryside. Right, so we've got our 20-minute barrier, Sam. If you're listening to a podcast, you know I'm going to throw loads of quick-fire questions at you and try and catch you out and put you on the spot. So no pausing or hesitating. I'm going to try and sum up our conversation and throw the odd question to you. So let's start off with... Um, let's tell listeners what your plans are for the weekend. My plans for the weekend, I've got an RE course all day tomorrow, and then I'm going to watch Newcastle on Sunday. 
Okay, and is it Newcastle for the win or, or is it Chelsea? Head or heart? Um, my dad is a massive Chelsea fan, so head and heart say Chelsea, to be honest. <laughs> okay, and was Alan Shearer good as he said, good as as the Newcastle fans say he was, or, or is it all a, a bit of an illusion? Better. <laughs> there you go. Um, what's on your uh, leadership desk back at school for Monday morning? What are you working on? I've got three... Um, referrals for education health and care plans to be finished right there there's a headache um what book are you reading at the moment i am reading um babies and toddlers for men <laughs> crikey that sounds interesting um finish this sentence if i were education secretary of state i would start again so, <laughs> a piece of advice for someone who wants to become a senko use the parents they're a great, okay. they're a great Use the parents. Uh, top tips for uh, anyone wanting to go to Preston University? Um, check it out first. Okay. Um, <laughs> t- top tips for doing a psychology degree? Um, be critical in your thinking. Okay. If you met Mr. Cl- is it Mr. Clifford? If you met Mr. Yeah. Clifford again, what would you say to him? I'd say thank you. I've already thanked him. I went on a training course with Sir John Jones and he said, reach out to the teacher that made the difference to you. And I thanked him and he replied and it was it was amazing. Uh, oh, that is amazing. I've, I've been lucky enough to do that. I've got my uh, Mr. Baldy. He follows me on Instagram still, so it's lovely to still have a connection with him. Um, okay, what's your be- uh, thing that you're most proud of, kind of career achievement? Um, I had an article published in Nason's Connect magazine and was nominated for an award. Brilliant. Um, uh, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Um, Paul Watson. He's Paul Watt Five on uh, Twitter, and he's really modest. He's a really fantastic teacher, but he really doesn't shout about it. Right. I'll chase Paul down. Um, what's the simplest barrier a teacher can remove from a, for a child? The amount of time that they're stood talking and doing nothing else. Okay, nice. Um, easy one. Where can listeners find out more about your Connect Online or school? Uh, I'm on Twitter at, at MrKeys underscore DHT. And then a big question to finish. What, what would you hope to be your legacy, Sam? I want kids to see me like I saw Mr Clifford. Right, well, there you go. So, uh, Sam, thank you. Uh, Listeners, Sam Keyes, Deputy Head Teacher at St. Bede's Catholic Primary School up in Newcastle. Sam, thank you for your time. I'm really glad that we finally got this podcast sorted. And uh, I'm definitely going to come and knock on the school door when I get up to Newcastle soon. Yeah, all Uh, Have a good weekend. You too. (laughs) Cheers, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you later. Cheers.